Warning. The following video contains scenes of graphic violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Nobody knew why it was called Killer Hill. Of course, we all had our guesses. The older kids used to try to scare the young ones with stories about how some kid had died on the slope. Sometimes they were basic deaths, hitting a tree or a rock, as reckless sledders are wont to do. Some were more creative, featuring grisly serial killers sporting rusty axes, just waiting in the bushes for some kid to come down the hill alone. Uh, kids can be pretty fucked up, to be honest. When I was young, I spent a lot of time at the sledding hills with my brother and sister. There was one main hill. We simply called it the Big Hill. But some of the more adventurous kids called it Kitty Hill, because it was no match for Killer Hill. Next to the Big Hill was Twister Hill. It followed a winding path that barely existed and ended with a sharp turn against a tree. A lot of kids smashed their faces into that tree, but most of them got away with just a few bruises, maybe a bloody nose. One year, a kid got hit so hard he had to go to the hospital, and that stopped our fun for the rest of that winter. The third and final hill was Killer Hill. It was a steep drop, full of sharp bumps, and if you weren't careful, you could easily go flying off your sled onto the black ice that hid beneath the snow. At the bottom of the hill was a small creek. Usually it was frozen over in the winter, but in the early months, sometimes the ice was thin enough to crack. If you couldn't stop your sled before you hit the creek, you had three options. One was to jump sled and abandon it to its fate, hoping that you could retrieve it later. Another was to try to jump the creek. Only a few kids were ever successful in that endeavor. The third was to simply hold tight and fall into the creek, hoping that the ice wouldn't crack. As you can imagine, a lot of sleds were sacrificed to Killer Hill. When I was growing up, my siblings and I were banned from both Twister and Killer Hill. We didn't really mind, to be honest. None of us were risk-takers or real thrill-seekers. We enjoyed our big, gentle slope. You could still get some speed going without having to worry about braining yourself on a tree stump. But, of course, things and people tend to change as you get older. When I turned 12, I started to grow interested in Killer Hill. Once, just once, mind you, I wanted to taste its slope, just so I could say that I had done it. I got my wish. That winter, we had a terrible snowstorm. My mom had just managed to get us kids into town to stay with my grandma. We lived out on a farm, and heating and power were somewhat iffy during bad blizzards. We spent a lot of time at my grandma's in the winter, which is just how we liked it. Grandma spoiled us plenty. The snowstorm lasted for three days, during which nobody left the house and the schools were closed. Well, that's not entirely accurate. You see, nobody was supposed to leave the house, but it was inevitable that some morons would go outside and freeze to death. It happened every winter. Within a few days, missing persons reports would begin to pop up, followed shortly after by bodies. It was unfortunate, but that sort of tells you something about humanity, don't you think? Anyway, on the third night, the storm finally subsided, and by the next day, the world was livable again. The plows had managed to mostly clear the streets, most people still weren't driving, but you could at least walk outside without succumbing to giant slopes of snow. The temperature had risen enough to leave the house as well. School was still cancelled, as it was still too dangerous to drive, so us kids had another day all to ourselves. And I knew just how I wanted to spend it. My grandma didn't live far from Big Hill. Now, both she and my mother tended to be a little overprotective, and most of the time they wouldn't have let us kids go out sledding just after a big snowstorm like that. But we were sick and tired of being cooped up in Grandma's little townhouse, and they were just as sick and tired of having to deal with us. So they let us take our sleds with a stern admonition that we were to be extremely careful on the hill. That's an order I was bound to break. 
We were the first kids to get to the hill that day. We'd gotten up early that morning to ensure we'd have a clean hill to sled on. The snow was still a little full and fluffy, but we'd pack it down during the first few rides. But first, there was something I had to do. My younger brother and sister got a bit quiet as I headed over to the mouth of Killer Hill. I could see the sharp twist of the creek at the bottom, and my heart began to race. Sarah, my little sister, and the youngest of us three, immediately started to shout that I wasn't supposed to go down that hill because Mom had said so. Hush, don't get your panties in a bunch. Mom doesn't have to know because none of us are going to tell her. Got it? Sarah bit her lip, but she kept her mouth shut. Our brother, Thomas, was only two years younger than I was, and I could see the interest in his eyes. He wanted to watch me do it, so I knew he wouldn't be telling on me anytime soon. I set down my sled at the top of the hill. It was hot pink. I remember that now. For some reason, that part of my memory has always stood out so strongly. Perhaps it was the contrast of the pink against the snow. I decided to ride the hill on my knees, thinking it would give me the best chance at controlling my trajectory. I positioned myself carefully, holding on to the wooden post at the side of the hill so that I wouldn't go down prematurely. I looked down at the sharp fall waiting for me, wondering what it would feel like, the world dropping away from my body. I took a deep breath, and I pushed. It was the ride of my life. The initial push felt sort of like the first drop of a roller coaster. Your stomach flies into your throat. You feel weightless and out of control. I think I screamed, but I don't remember. I was gripping the sides of the sled so hard that I thought I was going to break my fingers. I had only a portion of a second to breathe before I hit the first bump. It sent me flying in the air, and I almost lost my sled, but I managed to hold on. I landed just fine, only to be thrown into the air again on the next bump. By the time I'd passed all the bumps, my knees were a bruised mess. I knew I'd be feeling it for days. I was speeding the rest of the way down the hill, and I began to feel a strange, bubbling euphoria. This was it. I was gonna make it. And then I remembered. The creek. Frozen, hopefully, just at the foot of the hill. As I neared the end of the slope, I realized I had a second, maybe two at most, to either jump my sled or try to jump the creek. It was no surprise what I chose. I uncurled my fingers from the edges of the sled and rolled off, watching it fly off into the surrounding trees, suddenly weightless. What I hadn't anticipated was the fact that I had built up some serious momentum. I was still sliding forward, ever closer to the edge of the creek. I pressed myself to the ground as hard as I could, scrabbling for something to hold on to. I managed to generate enough friction to finally start slowing down. It was a heart-stopping moment when I just barely managed to grind myself to a halt, my hands hanging off the edge of the creek even as I trembled. I breathed a heavy sigh of relief and was just barely aware of the sound of my sister shouting and my brother cheering me on. Safe, I thought, laughing as I stared down into the creek that I had narrowly avoided becoming intimately acquainted with. My laughter stopped abruptly when I saw the pool of red, a lone black mitten floating in the congealing mess. My eyes drifted, horrified, to the other black mitten, still attached to a hand, and that hand was attached to a body, a very small, very delicate body, with a lot of blood pouring out of its head. Even through the heavy snowsuit the child wore, I could tell that it wasn't breathing. I started to scream. I didn't get in trouble for going down Killer Hill, if you're wondering. I became somewhat famous overnight, though, being the one to find Dylan Fick's body in the creek. His parents had filed missing persons reports on the third day of the snowstorm. They weren't sure where he'd gone, only that he'd taken his snowsuit with him. They didn't think to check the shed to see if he'd taken his sled. Dylan was a third grader, just like Sarah. He should have known better than to go out in a storm, but he was tired of being cooped up all day too, like us. He figured he knew the hills well enough, even in the blinding snow. He hadn't seen the start of the creek when he went down the hill. 
He went headfirst into the ice, managing to hit his head hard against a stone protruding from the creek bed. They aren't sure how long it took him to bleed out, but it wasn't a quick death. Not by a long shot. In the end, he was just a kid. All kids do stupid things. Most of them just don't die from them, I guess. The sledding hill was abandoned for a few years after that. None of us would dare to go back. None of us could get Dylan's face out of our heads. And I certainly couldn't forget what he looked like, lying on the ice, covered in frost. So still. But I grew up. I'm not a kid anymore. I'm an adult, with a husband, and kids, and a mortgage that I'm going to spend half my goddamn life paying off. My kids came home from school today, talking about a sledding hill on the edge of town. They wanted to know why it's called Killer Hill. They asked me to take them as soon as the first snow hits. You know, when we were kids, none of us knew how it got the name Killer Hill. But I know now how it kept it. The doctor told me I have to write this. He said it might make me feel better. I don't think that's true. It has been so long that the doctor must know there is no getting better for me. You know what I think it is? Morbid curiosity. At my expense, of course. The doctors might have pretended to be empathetic at first, but they don't put that effort in anymore. Now, I'm just an interesting case study that they pass around when they're having a slow day. And there's nothing I can do about it, except to take deep, slow breaths like Tabby taught me, and write. Tabby is my therapist. She doesn't let me call her Dr. Gron. She said that we're friends. That sounds cheesy, but she's the only person that cares about me here. The one person, interestingly enough, who has never manipulated me. She still believes there's a chance for me. She only wants me to be happy. Okay, deep breaths in and out. Why do they want to read this? They know the story anyway. Perhaps they are looking for inconsistencies. Enough stalling. Here I go. It starts with Christmas. I can't say that I didn't like Christmas, but it wasn't exactly my favorite holiday. Yes, there's feel-good movies, and hot chocolate, and presents, and family time. Yes, there's Christmas carols, and Christmas cookies, and Christmas dinner. Yes, there's Santa, and elves, and reindeer. But there's also Christmas trees. And I hate Christmas trees. My parents used to think it was funny. It started when I was a really little kid, maybe around five or six. I was too young to really help with decorating the tree, so my parents sent me to spend the day with my grandma, intent on surprising me with a fully decorated Christmas tree when I got home. We'd never had a Christmas tree before because, in the past, we'd lived in a tiny apartment and didn't have the space for one. My parents had finally bought their own house, and they wanted to go all out on the decorating. When I came home, there was a monster in the living room. It wasn't even recognizable as a tree once they were done with it. That was the problem. It was a huge green and red and gold monster looming over me with menace. It looked like it was ten feet tall. My parents hung up very classy ornaments, trying to make the tree look like something Martha Stewart would jizz over. But to me, they didn't look elegant. They looked twisty, and spiky, and sharp. Threatening. To top it off, there was no angel at the top of the tree. In its place was a Santa hat. It looked awful with those ornaments, let me tell you. My parents were never very up-to-date on what was fashionable. Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. My point is, with the addition of that hat, the monstrosity 
didn't look like a tree anymore. It looked like some kind of weird beast out of my nightmares, intent on swallowing me up and strangling me with its ropes of garland, stabbing me to death with its pointed ornaments, all while leering down at me, its eyes hiding under that god-awful hat. And I just knew it had eyes under there. Somewhere, they were watching me, watching my every move. I screamed. I screamed and cried and threw a fit. My parents were absolutely bewildered. When I was finally able to stutter out why I was so afraid, they laughed at me. Of course, it must have seemed very silly to them, and they didn't laugh to be malicious or cruel. But it really hurt me. Why couldn't they see how terrible that thing was? Uh, they got rid of the tree, and we didn't have one for many years after that. The story became very popular in our family. I hated hearing it every year. And I always hated Christmas trees after that. My attitude toward Christmas itself cooled off, too. I actually liked Halloween more. Those things were supposed to be scary. It was expected. The fact that nobody could see what was scary about Christmas trees upset me all the more. And what about all the other creepy Christmas traditions? The elf on the shelf. What sick fuck came up with that? And midnight mass on Christmas, where the church is dark but for a hundred candles casting shadows against the stained glass. And don't get me started on Stalker Santa. So yes, we celebrated Christmas in my house, but we didn't have a Christmas tree. Not until my younger brother came into the mix. He's three years younger than me. His name is Ethan. I tell myself that every day to make sure I don't forget it. Sometimes I'm afraid I'll wake up one day and his name will be gone forever. It feels that way whenever they change my medication. I won't forget. If that's the only good thing that comes from writing this down, so be it. Anyway, Ethan. When Ethan was six, my parents decided to reintroduce the Christmas tree. They sat down and had a talk with me about how they wanted Ethan to have that experience, how I was old enough not to be afraid of the tree. I told them that of course I wasn't afraid, I'd gotten over that a long time ago. Inside though, I was sick with fear. But I couldn't let it show because I love Ethan. I love him more than anything in the world. I wanted him to have the best Christmas ever. So we got a tree. My parents tried to get me to help decorate. I wanted to refuse, but Ethan begged me, and I just couldn't. So I helped string up the garland and the lights. The whole time I felt like the fucking thing was mocking me, laughing at me. I can't explain it. It was like it knew I was afraid, knew I felt the danger emanating from its branches. Once in a while, a branch would scrape across my arm and I'd jump. It felt like the tree was reaching out for me. That was a long afternoon. Once the tree was decorated, I avoided it as much as possible. I stayed out of the living room when I could, and when I couldn't avoid it, I kept my eyes averted. I thought that maybe, since I was a few years older, it wouldn't be so frightening, but I was wrong. It was even worse. I felt like it was mocking me in my fear. I know how it sounds. Anyway, Ethan absolutely loved the tree. He would sit in front of it every day after school, playing with the ornaments and lights. Sometimes he'd get up in the middle of the night and curl up to sleep under the tree. My parents took a few pictures of him like that. They thought it was so cute. I wonder where those pictures are now. Not that anyone would let me see them. So, life went on. Christmas got closer and Ethan was getting more and more excited. He... God, he just loved Christmas so much. And I didn't, but I loved that it made him happy. And I was more than happy to play along with him to get him into the Christmas spirit. And then before we knew it, Christmas Eve arrived.
We had Christmas Eve traditions, like any family. We would all cuddle up in the living room with cups of hot chocolate and watch Christmas movies. Ethan and I would each get to choose one present from under the tree to open a day early. We would set out milk and cookies, and then we'd all go to bed. Sometime about half an hour after going to bed, my parents would shake jingle bells outside our rooms to convince us that Santa had arrived. At nine years old, I obviously was much too old to believe in Santa, thank you very much, but Ethan loved it, so it was okay. But that Christmas Eve was different. It was different because I was sick. I really wasn't faking. I really wasn't faking. I think my parents suspected I was to get out of sitting in the living room near the Christmas tree, but I honest to God felt nauseous and freezing cold. I finally convinced my mom by asking her to take my temperature. I was running a pretty substantial fever. I remember her frowning as she looked down at the thermometer. Oh honey, I'm sorry I didn't believe you. I can still see her in my mind's eye, fly away strands of her long black hair falling in front of her eyes. My eyes look just like hers. We'll get you in bed, sport. You can open the first present tomorrow. Dad offered as consolation. I can't see his face as clearly, but I can see his stature, the way he dwarfed the room. He was invincible. I always felt that way. Nothing could beat my dad. I went to bed, dozing into a fitful sleep, my brother's laughter drifting in and out of my ears as I slowly relaxed. The next few hours passed in a haze. I thought perhaps my fever had gotten worse because I kept hearing things. I heard my parents arguing about something. I heard something fall downstairs. I heard a strange rustling noise. The noises punctuated my dreams, a long string of nightmares about Santa and knives and shattered Christmas lights. I gasped into consciousness as I was dreaming about choking to death on a candy cane. It seemed rather silly when I woke up, but it doesn't seem silly now. It was about three in the morning when I woke up. I was feeling better, but I still had a bit of a fever. I decided to walk back down the stairs for a glass of water. I remember chuckling to myself, thinking about how surprised I'd be if I ran into Santa. Wouldn't that be something? But my giggling sounded a little strained to my ears. I was nervous. Why was I nervous? I couldn't trace the feeling to its source. I only knew that something about that night wasn't letting me relax. I walked down the stairs in the pitch black, not wanting to turn on the lights and wake anyone else up. I reached the landing and walked toward the kitchen. Okay, this is the part that gets hard. Deep breaths. Think of Ethan. I knew something was wrong. Even as I got a glass of water from the tap, I could sense it. I couldn't pinpoint exactly what was going on at first, and then it hit me. The sound. See, this wasn't noise. It wasn't obnoxious and grating and immediately recognizable. It was just a slow, deep sound that was vaguely familiar, vaguely unsettling. And it was coming from the living room. My hand trembled around the glass as I stared across the kitchen. The kitchen opened directly into the dining room, which was connected to the living room. The door between the dining room and living room was shut. My parents had hung a Christmas wreath on it. It looked a lot less festive in the dark. For a long moment, I just stared at the door, willing the sound to go away, but it didn't. The world doesn't work like that. I learned that lesson well that night. Eventually, I had to make a decision. I could go upstairs and go back to sleep, or I could buck up and see what was making that noise. I wanted so badly to just go back to bed, but I knew that I couldn't. Maybe if it was just my mom and dad in the house, maybe then I would have gone to wake them up. But all I could think of was Ethan, and how it was my job as the older brother to protect him. I crept across the kitchen, through the dining room, 
and ended up staring at that door. The sound was louder over there. It took me a few more minutes to work up the courage to open the door. I told myself that it would be like ripping off a band-aid. Opening the door would be the worst part, and then everything after that would be okay. Isn't it funny? Not really, I guess. I opened the door. My whole life ended in a moment. My parents were on the floor, their bodies twisted and crumpled together. They looked like they'd been flayed alive, their skin hanging in ribbons off their bodies. The air was so thick with blood you could taste it in the back of their mouth. My parents, on the floor, and I couldn't tell where one body started and the other body began. Ripped and pulled and flayed apart. But I didn't get much time to look at them because a thin, wheezing sound caught my attention. I dragged my eyes over to the tree, the source of the sound. That deep rumbling was somewhere in the background, but it was no longer a priority at this point, as you can imagine. No, that wheezing noise was somehow more pressing, and it only took a second to figure out why. Ethan, in, in the tree, breathe, keep breathing, I'll, I'll get through this. Mm. Ethan was in the tree, as in his head, and one of his arms was sticking out of the branches. The rest of the body was somewhere deeper in the thickness of the monstrosity. The wheezing sounds were the pitiful attempts he was making to keep breathing. I shrieked and ran towards him, stumbling over a bloody hand. I still don't know whose it was. Ethan was being pulled further and further into the tree, his eyes glazed over with a thick kind of haze. I desperately wanted him to look at me, but he seemed incapable of doing so. Oh God, oh God, oh Jesus Christ! He didn't hear me. I grabbed his arm and yanked. I was his big brother. I was his hero. I was going to get him out of the tree and somehow everything would be okay. The wheezing sound got worse as I struggled. It felt like he was tied to the tree. That's how strong its grip was. But I was determined. I knew I could do it. Eventually, I pulled him free, and we stumbled back together. I fell hard on my ass, clutching my baby brother to my chest, elated that I had saved him. Except I hadn't. I'd only saved half of him. His body ended at about the waist, thin shreds of flesh and muscle hanging down in strings. His intestines were hanging out too, at least what was left of them. It almost looked like... God, it almost looked like the tree had eaten him. I tried talking to him then. I remember thinking I could still fix it. Hey, Ethan. Hey, wake up. Please, Ethan, come on. Wake up, it's Christmas. You can't go away on Christmas. He never even heard me. He was basically dead already, although it took a few more moments for his heart to actually stop beating. I sat there, in the middle of the living room, my parents bleeding into the carpet behind me, my dead baby brother twitching in my arms. I sat there, and I looked at the Christmas tree. And I listened to the deep, rumbling sound. The sound of something pulling in and pushing out. The tree shook a little with it, its pine needles quivering in time. It was the sound of the tree, breathing. Usually, this is the part where I tell you that I blacked out and don't remember a thing. That the police found me the next morning, rocking my baby brother back and forth and singing Christmas carols. And I only know about that because you've told me about it over and over and over. Well, here's something new for you to analyze. I remember every goddamn second of that night. 
That night that never seemed to end. I spent it staring at that tree in abject horror, knowing for a certainty that it would come for me, knowing that it would eat me alive too, just as it had done to my brother, knowing that its needles had sharpened and hardened when we weren't paying attention, and that they had been used to flay my parents apart. The tree swayed and shivered throughout the night, and I knew, I just knew, that at some point it would bend over and reach out for me and sweep me into the maw that was hidden somewhere deep in the branches. Except it didn't. Eventually, the quivering stopped, the breathing stopped, the tree was still as stone but for the trickles of blood still falling from its needles. It was a few minutes later that the police came through the door and found me sitting there. Our neighbors had called the cops. I must have screamed at some point during our standoff. Or several points. It didn't matter. They came, and they found me, and they took me away, and now I'm here. But you knew that already. So that's it. There you go. You made me write it out, and now you can share it with your colleagues and laugh at me. I know you do. I can hear the laughter in their voices at my expense. You know what the worst part about being stuck here is? It's not being treated like I'm crazy. I don't give two shits about that. It's the fact that you've deprived me of everything that has to do with my family, and you don't even care. I don't have pictures of them. I don't have any of their belongings. I don't even know what you did with the house. Is it still empty, I wonder? Would anyone dare buy it? I never even found out what present Ethan opened that night. The night before... I think about that a lot. What his last toy was. You don't tell me what the police found during their investigation. Not that it matters, because I know what happened. But did they? Maybe they think I did it. Maybe that's why you're keeping me here. In the end, though. In the end... It doesn't matter. My life ended that night. Do you even understand that? It was over the moment I opened that door. I opened the door to eternal night. One that I can never escape. And you bastards are enjoying watching me suffer in it. Merry fucking Christmas. December 25th, 2018, was the worst day our town had seen since its founding. People call it the Christmas of the Lost. My heart yearns to shatter just writing about it. Hundreds of parents laid out gifts under their Christmas trees the night before. Each parent woke up to an identical scene as when they went to sleep. Cookies and milk were untouched. Stockings bulged with undisturbed treats, and gifts rested in their places under the Christmas trees, cold from the lack of children's joy. My wife Nina and I were no exception. I remember us tiptoeing past our son's bedroom as we carried his gifts from Santa down the hall. Nina was tipsy on eggnog, and I had a bit of a holiday buzz going myself. We giggled and shushed each other as we stumbled through the house. It's one of my best memories, because it's the last time we ever laughed together. Hell, I can't even remember if we've laughed at all since then. Ronnie was sleeping in his bed as he always was. I know this because my wife and I bickered about her going in there to give him a goodnight kiss. Looking back now, I thank God she won that battle. It brings me something close to a hint of solace to know that some of his last moments in this house were spent under the care and love of the woman who carried him. We set up his tricycle, placing the largest yellow bow atop the handlebars that we could find. Nina's mother's tradition dictated that we place an orange at the bottom of his stocking, 
but the rest was filled with little toys and candy. I groaned as she handed me a full plate of cookies. Ugh, why do we always make so many again? <laughs> because it's fun. I don't know about you, but when Ronnie and I are making them, a small part of me actually believes they'll be eaten by Father Christmas. She blushed as she placed an amber strand of hair behind her dainty ear. The thick peanut butter cups atop the cookies were killing me that year. I remember choking on my own saliva, turned into a biting syrup by sugar. I got it done, though, leaving exactly one cookie uneaten for Ronnie to sneak in the morning. The milk, however, was all mine. We awoke to the sounds of sirens and the sun shining through our windows. Nina's bedside clock read 9.18 a.m. As much as I tried to fight it, a cold chill enveloped each cell in my body. We knew something was wrong. It's not normal for Ronnie to sleep in past 7 o'clock, but especially not on Christmas. Nina took off running to his room on instinct, fearing that he'd left the house and gotten hit by a car or injured. I held my breath, praying to hear his sleepy little voice. But so far, my wife's calls had gone unanswered. Chris, Ronnie's not here! She yelled down the hall. What do you mean he's not here? You haven't even checked the living room! Chris, I'm telling you, our baby's not fucking here! She choked out through sobs. Her footsteps boomed through the house, and I heard the front door slam shut as she left. My breath started coming in faster and larger puffs as I tried to process the quickly unfolding situation. The robe I wore the night before was disgusting on my skin. Nothing felt right. It's like in that moment I already knew that the joy in my life was over. I just couldn't accept it. Thousands of scenarios invaded my rationality from the corners I'd done so well at keeping them hidden in. Each fear I've ever had as a parent that was always out of reach for someone like me was now all too tangible. When I opened my front door, I was met with an overwhelming number of sobs and wails. Dozens of people on our street were outside of their homes. Most of them were crying hysterically. Some were blank expressions of shock. Others demanded to search every person's home on the block who didn't have children. I held my wife as she tumbled to the ground. An officer had told her every child in the county had gone missing Christmas Eve night. My brain fought with itself as to how I should feel. On one hand, hundreds of children kidnapped at the same time would be hard to house and even harder to hide. On the other hand, though, the irrational part of my mind told me that Something unnatural had happened altogether, and none of us would ever see our children again. As the months went on, and the seasons changed, most of the parents in town had reached the same heart-rendering conclusion. Until this morning. Nina and I are still married, she got on this kick right away about wanting another baby, which I was, am, fully against. First off, I felt if we tried for another child, we would be replacing Ronnie. Even worse, we'd be accepting the fact that he was never coming back. We didn't know that. I always held out heartbreaking hope that they'd find him, find all of the missing kids. Secondly, if something in this town was taking children, I certainly didn't want to give them a new target. Nina's screams woke me from my heavily medicated sleep. Chris! It's Ronnie! He's home! The covers are thrown in a corner of the room as I spring out of my now cold bed. Each step closer to my son fills my heart with a happiness I feared I no longer possessed. The long-lost and dearly missed sound of his voice stops me cold. Whoever is talking to Nina is not our little boy. His voice sounds low and detached. 
like it's being run through a voice synthesizer. My stomach heaves when I finally bring myself to finish taking the steps to his bedroom. A mutilated, mangled body lays in the bed that was once meant for our son. Don't get me wrong, he is alive and healthy. He just came back. Wrong. His face is a mingle of features that seem random at best. It was as if Picasso had genetically designed a human being and brought them to life. One leg is shorter than the other by six inches. His left arm is thinner and four shades lighter than his right. The left eye placed haphazardly on his face is one of the only qualities that proves to me it's really him. The eye on the right looks like it belongs to someone else entirely. Once again, the street is thick with police officers. But fire rescue is here this time too. Parents are holding disfigured children as they're laid on stretchers, each one yelling about how they're fine and don't need treatment. I caught eyes with the little girl who lived across the street from us, and I recognized one of them as my son's. Whatever happened, it's as if each child was put into a machine, had their DNA all mixed and randomized, and then spit back out. The children walk, talk, eat, and and play like they always have. It's almost impossible to tell whose is whose anymore. This Christmas, I'm hearing whispers of a reckoning of sorts. The town leaders and religious figures have labeled these children, some of them their own, as abominations. I've heard that there will be a massive event to return the children to the melting pot from which they came. I'm writing this as a warning and for proof for Ronnie down the line to know that his moms love him, and they never regret a single thing about who he is. We're taking him the hell out of here. By the time they notice a child's missing, we will be long gone. Surely, there's somewhere in the world that will greet him with acceptance and love. We're just happy to have him back. Though, I can't help but wonder what surprises Nina and I will wake up to this Christmas Day morning. I love visiting my grandma. She always makes the food that I like, and in large quantities, and spoils me. With the hustle and bustle of college life, it's nice to go back to my childhood and allow myself to be spoiled for a few hours every few weeks. Even though she has six grandchildren, she made it clear that I'm her absolute favorite. She'd often have the whole family around for dinner, and after they left, she'd bring out the good stuff she made just for me. We usually have a big Christmas dinner together with the whole family. However, as the years go by and the younger ones start growing up, fewer and fewer people show up. Last year, everyone already made plans, forgetting about poor grandma. I don't blame them, but they often forget how these visits mean a lot to her, especially ever since grandpa died. That's why when I talked to her on the phone and she asked me if I had any plans, I lied to her and told her I didn't. She immediately jumped at the opportunity to politely invite me, going so far as to offer me to sleep over at her place. She said there's one room which hadn't been used in years and I could stay in there. I immediately said yes and agreed to stay over, realizing how happy that would make her. I canceled the plans I made with my friends, telling them something else had come up. Although they were bummed about it a little, their drinking party wouldn't stop because of me. That was the last Christmas I would ever spend with my grandma. On Christmas Eve, I arrived to my grandma's place and she greeted me like she always does, with a tight hug and lots of kisses. I barely even stepped inside when she started offering me food. She had already made what could only be described as an all-you-can-eat buffet. We dug in and once we were done, she showed me where I could sleep for the night. It was a cozy little bedroom, which apparently used to be my mom's room when she was little. Grandma told me not to leave my room during Christmas night in order to avoid disrupting Santa and his work. She said that if I really needed to use the bathroom I could, but to be extremely quiet and not to go downstairs. On the nightstand she left a list of things I should do before I go to bed to ensure I get a good present. 
I decided to play along and abide by the rules. I told her I'd read it before bed and do everything necessary, and she seemed content with that. She wished me good night and left the room. I was pretty tired from the trip and the enormous dinner I've eaten, so I lay down on the bed and involuntarily fell asleep within minutes. I awoke a few hours later. I glanced at my watch and realized it was 3.01 a.m. I got up to grab a glass of water downstairs from the kitchen and groggily walked through the dark, trying to avoid any loud noise or turning on the lights, not to wake Grandma. I went downstairs and turned on the kitchen light, gulping down a glass of water. I glanced towards the living room at the Christmas tree, and something caught my attention under the glow of the decoration lights. There was a small plate with a tiny paper that read, For Santa. I reckoned it was cookies and milk, but when I got closer I found that the plate was empty. Red liquid was in it, and right next to the plate was a small bucket. Obviously, I found this weird, but figured that Grandma must have just forgotten to put it away or something. I turned off the kitchen lights and returned to my room, just then remembering the list Grandma gave me. I grabbed it off my nightstand and started reading. Dear James, thank you for visiting me for Christmas. You made your grandma really happy. Now Christmas is a little different in this house than what you're probably used to, so it's very important that you follow these rules on the list. 1. Make sure to close your windows and ensure that they are properly closed. These old windows don't work properly sometimes, so if you feel like cold air is coming in, let me know. 2. Don't put any wood in the fireplace after 9 p.m. Santa will be really angry if it's scalding in the chimney or if there's still smoke. 3. You didn't forget about milk and cookies, did you? I stopped reading and chuckled at the list. Grandma clearly wanted me to follow the basic rules for Santa like when I was a kid, but again I decided to oblige. I continued reading the list. In this household, we don't use milk and cookies. We use raw meat and blood. I already left a bucket by the Christmas tree, and there's a raw piece of chicken I put on the plate. Santa sure loves his diet. 4. If you are woken up by the sound of scratching or knocking on your window, ignore it. Your room is on the second floor. There is no way to reach up to it. In fact, it's best not to look there. But if you see someone beckoning you, pretend they're not there. They may try to open the window from the outside. This is why it's so important to keep the windows closed. 5. You may hear growling coming from the kitchen. It's okay, because Santa never comes upstairs. And since I already left the chicken for him, that should satisfy him. By this point, I was sure Grandma was just messing with me. That was until I heard the sound of three gentle knocks on the window behind me. I froze in place, staring at the list, but practically staring through it. Three more gentle knocks ensued, but I did my best not to give away that I heard them. Once again, there were three more knocks, and the sound of scratching started. First gently, then louder, as if a rat was trying to bite through the wall. It lasted around a minute until it completely stopped. Only when it did, did I gather enough courage to slightly shift my position. That was a mistake though, because when I looked down to the floor, at the light which was cast in through the window, I saw the unmistakable shadow in the form of a humanoid silhouette stretched across. I couldn't tell for sure, but it looked like whoever was there held both hands on the window and stared directly towards me. I decided the best thing to do was continue reading the list to try and distract myself. 6. If someone walks into your room while you're sleeping and you happen to wake up, pretend that you're still asleep. In the worst case scenario, the person will sit on the edge of your bed and observe you. So do your best not to let them know that you're awake. 
If you feel their breath on your neck and it gets progressively closer, it means they realized you're awake. Seven, you may hear me calling you from downstairs. Don't listen to it. I will under no circumstances go downstairs during the night. Eight, last and most important rule. If you get up to go to the bathroom, never, ever, ever turn on any lights in the house. He has trouble noticing you in the dark. But if you turn on the lights, he will be able to follow you wherever you go. And then not even locking your door or windows will help. 9. Follow these simple rules, and in the morning we can open your Christmas presents. Love, Grandma. The scratching and knocking had already stopped by the time I was done reading, and the shadow from the window was gone. I got into bed and covered myself over my head, shivering, and not from the cold. Sometime during the night I heard my door open, but did my best to ignore the footsteps and low growling noise. I either passed out or fell asleep sometime later, but all I know is I woke up to the sound coming downstairs from the kitchen. I shot up, looking around the room and at the window, rubbing my temples and thinking about the nightmare I had. I left my room and immediately heard my grandma's voice calling me from downstairs to come open the presents. I told her I'm coming when I suddenly felt a grip on my wrist. I turned around and saw my grandma there, staring at me, wide-eyed. She leaned in and whispered in my ear, with a trembling voice. You turned on the lights, didn't you? Thank you.